Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Canadian Electricity Association's conversation webinar series. The CEA is the voice of the electricity industry in Canada. My name is Farhan Mirza, and I'm pleased to be your host for today's webinar. I would first like to acknowledge Canada as the land of First Peoples, Inuit, and Métis. I would like to pay homage to the Indigenous peoples past, present, and future that continue to work, educate, and contribute to the strength of our country. I would like to recognize that the land is shared through historic treaties, developed through contemporary treaties, and one that continues to be unceded territory. I would also like to recognize that the land on which I'm broadcasting you today from is traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. The Algonquin peoples have lived on this land since time immemorial, and I'm grateful to the, have, have the opportunity to present on this territory. The conversation series features presentations from CEA's corporate partners, and the series will highlight a variety of Canadian and international solutions to current and future challenges faced by the industry. Working with CEA's corporate partners, these webinars have been developed to be of specific interest to those working in the electric utility space from generation through to the customer. For a list of upcoming sessions, please check out CEA's website at www.electricity.ca. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Our session today is scheduled to run from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Questions can be asked, and we'd encourage you to do so by typing them into the chat function as they come to mind, and we'll ask them at the end of the presentation. And a brief survey will be sent to our webinar participants following the session today. We'd very much appreciate your feedback and are interested in any topics you'd like to have covered in the conversation series in the future. And please keep an eye out for future webinars and events through CEA's current affairs newsletter. With over 6,000 subscribers, current affairs, much like the national newspaper, is the place to go for Canadian industry news as we welcome, as we connect the national value chain from generation through to the customer. If you'd like to receive current affairs, you can subscribe to this free publication on CEA's website, again, at electricity.ca. Today, Redline Communications will talk about industrial grade wireless networks. When considering a wireless network solution, it is important to understand why the distinct characteristics of the industrial environment demand industrial grade wireless communication systems that are purpose built for these industries. This webinar presents the framework to explain why the wireless communication systems integrated with a critical industrial systems must be treated as different from those found in traditional enterprise IT environments. We will also elaborate on what industrial grade means when it comes to point to point, point to multi point, nomadic and cellular wireless communications in industrial environments such as public utilities, oil and gas, mining, uh, public safety, and transportation. Joining us today from Redline Communications is Dr. Isak Mian, VP of Sales and Support Engineering. Dr. Mian leads customer facing engineering and project management departments to align Redline's product and services solutions customers' business needs and challenges. He has over two decades of industrial telecom experience with manufacturers and direct end users, including previous roles at Hydro One, Ericsson, and Nokia. Dr. Mian recently completed his doctorate in engineering management from George Washington University. His research focuses on risk analysis of large-scale projects, which integrate information and communications technology with North American power grid. Dr. Mian, welcome to the conversation series, and I'll now turn the session over to you. Thank you, Farhan, and hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's session. Um, we have a long session ahead, a lot of, uh, uh, you, know, um, you know, major topic to cover. Uh, so I'll get to it right away. Um, as uh, Farhan briefly described, we are talking about, um, uh, you know, industrial grade wireless networks today uh, not specifically what the technology is and things like that or the architecture uh, but more about you know uh, uh, what do we mean by industrial grade when we talk about wireless networks uh, and why it's something that we uh, should focus on why should we even distinguish between industrial grade wireless network and uh, you know regular telco uh, or enterprise grade um, uh, networks and associated equipment um, so uh, you know that's I'll, I'll begin with answering the why first to establish the constant context and to uh, make sure that we understand and address this question 
question in my 15 years at Hydro One, you know, um, that, that question uh, would pop up um, almost every single project, uh, specific, specifically from, uh, you know, the non-OT uh, stakeholders within the organization um, as to, you know, when building a substation land, why can't we just go ahead and uh, deploy a regular Ethernet switch? Why do we have to go with a utility grade, industrial grade, um, uh, hardened Ethernet box. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, answering that question, what we've done here at Redline is we've developed a framework that helps us, um, you know, uh, distinguish uh, the reasons uh, 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 and, and to understand uh, what, uh, you know, uh, why it's important to, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, and how to communicate that distinction to the non-OT stakeholders within our organization, within our customers' organization. Uh, so I'll talk about that framework and then uh, following that, we'll at a high level um, uh, try even to review uh, some of the key factors, the criteria um, uh, that uh, you know we think make um, the communication products in the market industrial grade or um, uh, enterprise grade, uh, depending on whether the criteria is fulfilled or not. Um, so uh, before that, you know, um, I know it's not a marketing presentation, so I'll try to be, uh, you know, just quickly tell you who Redline uh, is. We are a Canadian manufacturer of industrial grade private uh, wireless networks, including LTE. We are developing our um, uh, 5G technology, uh, which we call I5G, the industrial grade uh, 5G technology for mission critical infrastructure industries. Right now, we recently received, um, you know, uh, a, a major SIP grant from the government. So we've been identified as a strategic uh, company uh, by the government of Canada. Um, considering uh, the role that um, uh, we had expected to play um, in, in the Canadian economy and specifically supporting the mission critical infrastructure industries within this country. Um, so we are a global company though. Uh, we have employees in about uh, 14 uh, countries across the globe, projects in, uh, in 70 countries. Um, currently, um, you know, we have close to a million uh, uh, devices uh, deployed across the globe. Uh, whether it's um, uh, you know uh, a mine in 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 the north in the tundra or uh, you know somewhere in Alaska or a desert in Middle East um, anywhere on the planet uh, harsh environment um, you know I bet that you'll find some of red lines here there um, you know uh, the we 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 focus on wireless um, uh, technology specifically uh, fixed as well as mobility um, and um, as you can see on the right side um, you know of, of your screen um, you know uh, our uh, equipment we target industrial grade sort of military grade um, uh, you know segment of that market as opposed to end enterprise and career grade uh, and our targeted markets are um, as you can guess uh, by now, um, you know, is government, it's the industrial, critical industrial sectors, um, uh, like electric utilities, water utilities, the energy sector, oil and gas, mining, uh, government, public safety, these are the sectors we target. Our goal, um, you know, to enable Industry 4.0, the fourth industrial revolution or digital transformation, whatever, you know, term you use, uh, that's the goal, to enable it via wireless technology. Because uh, we believe that, um, you know, even though uh, the first thing that m m pops into, uh, you know, someone's mind when they hear the term digital transformation or, um, you know, Industry 4.0 is, um, you know, artificial intelligence or machine learning um, or big data, uh, you know, none of that is possible without uh, connectivity and specifically wireless connectivity. Uh, our goal is to uh, transform critical infrastructure, not just here in North America, but across the globe and to enable uh, that uh, uh, transformation via wireless technology across the globe in critical industries. So um, let's talk about, uh, you know, why industrial grade uh, and to under understand that we first need to understand um, it, you know why even wireless networks uh, to establish the right context um, you know uh, 
as I mentioned, it, it, right now, um, you know, we are at the cusp of that fourth industrial revolution, uh, Industry 4.0, a coin, uh, a term that was coined uh, by uh, German engineers uh, back in 2011. Um, you know, for the project of renewing the German um, manufacturing uh, system by integrating industrial systems with modern ICT, information and communication technologies. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, it, it's all about uh, enabling uh, or using AI and ML um, algorithms um, uh, by collecting big data and applying those algorithms to, big, to that big data to make real-time uh, decisions um, in the industrial uh, sector. Um, and of course, that can only be enabled via connectivity. And when it comes to connectivity, industrial environment, as dynamic as they are, um, wireless connectivity is the way uh, to go. Um, um, you know, simply because it's way uh, cost efficient. Um, and now with modern technology, uh, we can achieve the same level of reliability um, and, and fulfill the latency requirements um, uh, as wireline technology. Uh, so hence, in other words, uh, you know, for industrial system to transform, you need connectivity uh, to generate that big data from all the sensors um, all across your industrial infrastructure and then use AI ML algorithms to uh, analyze that data and make decisions in real time. Uh, decisions that impact uh, uh, the safety uh, and reliability of the uh, industrial infrastructure and the workforce that supports that infrastructure. So the, the first thing, as I mentioned earlier, the first thing we need to understand um, is, you know, what is the difference between the needs of industrial systems? Why can't we just go ahead and, you know, uh, take any um, you know, wireless product out there and deploy it in an industrial uh, for use uh, to support that industrial infrastructure? Uh, what's the difference? And um, uh, it is important to uh, distinguish between the two, um, uh, and and it, it is even more important to structure that message of 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 the the difference between the two uh, for specifically the non OT stakeholders within our organizations, um, and for that we've developed a framework here at uh, a red line which we call uh, the industrial triangle of distinction. Um, you know, it's nothing new. Um, I I believe most of us know uh, or most of the audience I would expect is they already know and understand uh, these differences, um, uh, you know, maybe even better than, you know, we do here. Uh, but it's, it's more how you structure that message to help uh, uh, the stakeholders within uh, organization in understanding uh, uh, that difference, uh, the non-technology folks or the non-OT folks. Uh, so three key aspects of this industrial triangle of distinction, and I'll elaborate these uh, uh, in the next slides. It's um, uh, the raison d'etre or the reason for existence of wireless networks is different. Um, you know, between the two uh, sectors, uh, you know, the telco sector uh, deploys the network for reasons that are completely different than, say, the electricity sector or the oil and gas sector. Um, you know, the function that these devices uh, perform um, are completely different. Uh, and the environment uh, that exists, uh, you know, uh, that an industrial system exists in, uh, is completely different than typically the urban or the suburban environment that a telco system, a telco wireless network exists in. Um, so we'll start with the reason for existence. Um, okay, the, the first thing that, um, you know, all of us who uh, plan and design uh, communication infrastructure for, um, you know, industrial and specifically critical in, uh, in industries. Um, the first thing we need to acknowledge is that OT, the operation technology, is different uh, from IT. A typical IT, as you can see on the left of your screen, uh, you know, you have um, your desktops, your soft phones, your cameras uh, connected to Ethernet switches, um, which are connected to a router via, you know, some sort of firewall, some sort of DMZ back to internet. Um, you know, and, and this infrastructure is there to manage information. And as critical uh, as that is, um, you know, this is uh, different 
than operations technology, which is there to actually manage physical processes, processes that the capital intensive assets um, and the workforce uh, and their safety depends upon. Um, you know, uh, uh, it's 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 one thing for information to be um, uh, not available if there's a, a disruption in the flow of information. Uh, and yes, you know, from an information system perspective, that is is critical. Uh, but it's completely different uh, uh, when there's a dis disruption in a physical process. Uh, in which case immediately lives can be at stake. Um, uh, so so the, the wireless technology uh, that exists in an enterprise environment, um, it, you know, performs, it, it, it exists for a different reason. It exists to, um, you know, uh, process that information to support the flow of information and the analysis of that information. Uh, in the OT environment, it exists uh, to uh, manage physical processes that the infrastructure and the system depends upon. Um, and that is an important distinction um, that we need to understand. Um, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, why it's important? Because um, at the end of the day, when we are developing um, and planning these, these communication networks, uh, uh, for these infrastructures, in, say in, a, in an electric utility environment, um, you have to keep in mind most of the times these are funded via the uh, OT side of the house um, and, it, and the reliability and the safety needs of that infrastructure and the workforce that supports that infrastructure, um, you know, usually take preference uh, over the needs um, on the IT side. Um, uh, so uh, when we design, um, you know, uh, when we are planning the network, looking at things like cost uh, and security needs, uh, we uh, need to prioritize the OT needs over IT needs in most cases. Uh, the other reason, you know, simple to understand, I guess, uh, wireless networks are deployed by uh, telcos, uh, you know, to generate revenue. Uh, it's a revenue drive uh, for an electric utility. It's a cost driver. Um, it's a necessary cost uh, to um, ensure uh, sort of the, the, the personnel and asset safety and, and the efficiency of the industrial system, the efficiency of the grid, uh, um, you know, for to, to protect the grid, uh, protect the people who are maintaining that grid. Um, you know, uh, it's a necessary cost. Uh, there. So, so that is an important difference to understand because uh, that, um, again, it's not just about, uh, you know, how you design the networks then, um, okay, and what kind of criteria do you use to evaluate the equipment that you're going to deploy in this infrastructure? Uh, it goes beyond that. It, it also gets into uh, the business case, um, entire business case of it. Uh, you know, some people will ask the question, okay, why can't, so if, if we're talking about distribution automation, why can't we just leverage, um, uh, you know, a telco's uh, infrastructure? Uh, the reliability needs of the distribution uh, system are, may not be as high and uh, they might be willing to do it. Sure, uh, but is, um, you know, does, uh, if, if I look at the province of Ontario, where I am right now in Toronto, um, and if I look at a major utility, uh, major telco like Bell Canada or, or, or Rogers or Telus even, uh, you know, what portion of uh, the geography of this province do they cover? Uh, Bell Canada, I know, covers less than 25% of the geography of this pro province. Uh, does the power system exist beyond that uh, geography? You bet it does. Okay. Is the, uh, is the telco uh, willing to uh, extend uh, the reach of their infrastructure to fulfill the needs um, of the power system beyond this 25% geography? Uh, well, it depends. How much are you willing to pay for it? Uh, so, you know, the, the, the needs there become or sort of uh, uh, different because they look at it from a revenue perspective. How much profit, because they have to respond to their shareholders, how much profit can they make out of this? Um, uh, you know, uh, for utility, it's a necessary cost. You know, whether a, a, a telco provides it or not, they need the communication infrastructure. Um, they need to support the SCADA. 
uh, uh, system, um, you know, of uh, transmission or distribution uh, um, station out there in the boonies. So they have to invest in that infrastructure. Uh, so, you know, with those needs, the reason of existence, uh, you know, that, that we must distinguish um, uh, between the two, uh, you know, the other aspect is the function, uh, you know, the, the function that wireless networks perform uh, in these environments is completely different. Um, at a very high level enterprise network, uh, you know, you um, have to provide broadband connectivity. The network has to provide broadband connectivity, emails, things like these, uh, or access even to uh, critical business critical uh, systems, um, you know, like SAP and things like that. Um, uh, on the industrial network side, um, okay, you need to fulfill the needs of both IT and OT. So yes, the project may be funded by OT, but you know, realistically speaking, it doesn't make sense for a utility to then go ahead and build a separate network for IT. Um, you know, to optimize that cost. Remember, it's a cost driver. Uh, to optimize the cost, to uh, make sure uh, that the infrastructure build remains cost effective. Uh, you know, in most of the times. Uh, Today specifically, uh, you'd have to look at the IT needs as well, and you have to make sure that on the one hand, the wireless network fulfills the, uh, say, ultra reliability and the latency needs of the uh, power system, but on the other hand, it also fulfills the bandwidth uh, needs of the IT system. Um, you know, and and the, or, or the mobility needs uh, yeah, on the power system sides, most assets you know may be fixed um on the uh, it side the business it side um, that may not be the case um, um in most utilities that that's not the case today so so with the fixed uh, uh, networks um, function uh, networking function and now you need to fulfill the mobility needs as well so the so the function of an enterprise network versus an industrial network are different industrial network needs to address the needs of both it and ot uh, you know, it's it's a bit more elaboration of the same thing in electric utilities. There's there's the power system side, uh, you know, as I mentioned, and then there's the business side. One's uh, mission critical, the other, the term now used is business critical. Uh, you know, on the one side, uh, uh, the wireless networks need to fulfill um, sort of the needs of uh, uh, teleprotection, SCADA, uh, uh, you know, mission critical voice and video. Uh, that's what the uh, telecom system that you put in place uh, where it needs to support on the IT side. Uh, it's it's primarily at a high level workforce product productivity and fleet management and things like that. It's the business systems that need to be supported. Um, uh, so uh, you know that it, 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 again it, it, on the IT side, um, the the function you know is primarily focused on on uh, sort of the business system on the OT side um is the protection control uh, the operational voice um as well as the it needs so what does that mean um okay that has implications when you design the network um uh, on you know the breadth of functions and the geography uh, uh, required uh, on both sides is is can be different um okay scada typically is low low bandwidth um you know for bulk power system um uh, you know for those substations um, you need to provide redundant connectivity uh, protection uh, relays ultra low latency um you know uh, redundancy extremely important uh, and you know one thing that uh, you know uh, sometimes the non OT folks uh, uh, forget uh, is uh, the complete control of outage planning. Uh, so uh, you know if you have a, a Bruce nuclear uh, station connected to your transmission grid, uh, you know you cannot have um, uh, the teleprotection uh, links. Uh, down on that um, infrastructure. You cannot do any maintenance on the communication infrastructure which supports uh, 
uh, uh, the protection and SCADA for that kind uh, of a generation station uh, without properly planning it. If it's scheduled maintenance, it has to be properly planned. ISO needs to get involved, Bruce Nuclear needs to get involved, um, you know, and, and you need approval from these or from ISO, for example, from the electricity system operator if you're outside Ontario. Um, okay, you need approval from the electricity system operator uh, to get you know that kind of an outage if it's a uh, uh, telco um, uh, in infrastructure um, can you maintain control of your outage planning uh, that's a big question mark and and you know uh, in most cases the answer would be no and hence the reason at least for bulk power system uh, the first preference is building a private infrastructure um, you know, and, and that is now as we get into smart grid, as we get into distribution automation and fission, things like that, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, that need for a private network uh, is increasing, uh, you know, because of things like these, because of there's other criteria as well, but because of these criteria like these, that need for a private network is increasing. Uh, and as it increases, uh, we need to understand, again, the difference between industrial systems and enterprise and telco environments. Um, uh, you know, to make sure that we uh, uh, plan these uh, the, this infrastructure and deploy it and, and operate it uh, the way it's supposed to be, in order to make sure that the needs of the power system are fulfilled um, uh, in a safe, reliable, secure, and cost-effective manner. So the third aspect, um, you know, the environment. I, you know, it, 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 if uh, we look at the environment that a communication infrastructure exists in in an urban uh, area or a suburban uh, area in my neighborhood for example uh, versus a high voltage substation versus an underground mine uh, versus an offshore oil rig uh, the environmental challenges are significantly different uh, from these environments uh, you know and and we uh, use five different criteria um, uh, to sort of help us uh, uh, differentiate uh, between the needs um, and where these systems exist, uh, you know, um, and as you can see, it's the, the industrial systems uh, exist in environments uh, where uh, there's significant uh, exposure to chemicals um, and corrosion chemicals that, uh, you know, can become an explosion hazard, um, you know, corrosion uh, that can, you know, uh, uh, destroy the equipment, um, you know, much faster uh, than uh, than it's supposed to be, increasing our maintenance costs. Um, RF propagation, these environments are typically, uh, you know, hostile RF environments uh, and dynamic, uh, high metal environments. Uh, so RF propagation um, uh, can be challenging. Um, now, that does not mean that RF propagation in a highly dense urban environment is not a challenge, but, you know, the challenge here is slightly different. Um, uh, the, uh, as I mentioned, the existence of that chemical introduce explosion hazards. Um, you know, there's power availability. Um, it, it, it's it's not always uh, possible uh, to provide 48 volt DC um, uh, to the uh, communication infrastructure everywhere um, in a power system or in a mine. Um, you know the. Uh, 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 voltage um, that you have, voltage levels, the system that you have in in uh, sort of relay building, for example, um, you know, maybe 250 volts DC, 125 volts DC. Uh, in mining, you may have a 24 volt uh, DC system. Uh, so power availability, and especially in then in remote rural areas, let's say you're building a transmission line, um, you know, out in the boonies, um, uh, how do you, uh, you uh, you know, provide power to your communication infrastructure, uh, which is necessary to exist there uh, uh, from a safety and communication perspective. Um, and then a lot of times there's like, you know, if you talk about, you know, uh, uh, distribution networks within urban suburban environments um, or a mine, um, you know, um, or oil rigs, things like these, um, you deal with confined spaces um, where air quality monitoring uh, becomes important, um, uh, for example example, and you need sensors and devices that need to communicate wirelessly uh, to make sure you're constantly monitoring those environments uh, 
uh, as people work in such kind of confined spaces. Uh, you know, I'll there's um, uh, uh, data. So you know, I'll quickly try to go through each of these factors. Um, you know, I'll try to be quick um, uh, um, to make sure we address the second part of this session as well. Um, uh, so the environment, chemicals and corrosion. You just need to look at uh, the NACE reports that are uh, published uh, periodically um, uh, to uh, sort of figure out the cost um, of corrosion uh, to the global economy and specifically North American uh, economy um, uh, because of uh, the harsh outdoor environment where uh, the infrastructure exists. Uh, you know, the, the wireless networks, the radio devices exist in that harsh environment, specifically if you, if you talk about a place like Canada. Um, uh, you know, so a, 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 we need to uh, understand uh, these hazards that are out there um, and we need to plan our networks for it. Uh, you know, same thing, RF, as I mentioned, hostile RF environments. And I have a, um, a case study that hopefully we'll get time to uh, go through in the end, um, uh, where a consultant um, evaluated, uh, you know, different type of equipment in hostile RF environment. And we, I'll share some results with you as to how, how important this is um, uh, to sort of uh, address at the planning stage um, uh, when it comes to building these networks for hostile RF environments. You know, explosion hazard, we all know, um, uh, you know, that that's a major hazard in, in uh, the environments that we work in and, and where, uh, for which we plan uh, the um, information and communication technology infrastructures. Uh, power availability, I already mentioned, it's another um, uh, you know, criteria that we have to keep in mind uh, when we're planning these networks, and so is confined uh, spaces. Um, gas sensing, air quality monitoring uh, to, mean, uh, to ensure the safety of our workforce um, uh, is critical. Um, uh, so, uh, it, you know, uh, and, and these systems, by the way, usually, um, you know, um, uh, require a low latency communications. Uh, so providing uh, or, or providing that function, uh, supporting this kind of an application for a wireless infrastructure um, is, is important. So, uh, you know, let's get to the second part of, of this uh, section. Now that we've discussed why it is important uh, to understand the difference between industrial um, environment and a regular, uh, you know, enterprise, commercial, telco environment. Um, uh, why it's important to understand that, um, you know, the wireless network in in the critical industry, in critical industry uh, uh, infrastructure must be industrial grade, must fulfill some special criteria. Um, uh, to ensure uh, the safety, reliability, and cost effectiveness um, of the systems uh, um, that uh, such an infrastructure supports. Um, you know, uh, we, the, the industrial triangle of distinction uh, helps us uh, dis communicate uh, that difference, um, uh, at least in our opinion. Uh, you know, and it helps us, uh, you know, understand our stakeholders, uh, uh, the, the uh, distinction between the two environments um, and, and to make sure uh, uh, that they understand why, uh, you know, engineers typically in this industry ask for uh, industrial grade or utility grade or IEEE 1613 compliance and things like these um, because, uh, you know, whether people accept it or not outside the industry, our requirements are special. Uh, uh, you know, we do have special requirements in these industries and the equipment that uh, we need must fulfill those special requirements. And what that special criteria is, uh, so again, uh, you know, we um, sort of categorize that into four uh, um, uh, broad categories. You know, uh, the, the industrial wireless networks must be uh, uh, safe uh, and safety enhancing. Uh, these must be reliable, uh, secure, and cost effective. Uh, now, what do we mean by that? It's not just enough to say, yeah, reliable, and everyone 
you know, um, uh, understands what liability means. Uh, uh, um, no, it's it's not enough. Uh, we need to dig deeper, and and I we don't have unfortunately time to go through every single aspect of these, but I will give you a couple of examples. Um, you know, to show that uh, you know we need to dig deeper to make sure. Um, that uh, you know, um, uh, we address all the key requirements, uh, and that all stakeholders, our vendors, our internal, uh, you know, non-technology stakeholders understand uh, uh, what they need to understand when we're building these networks. Uh, so you know, using the the sort of uh, in, in the industrial uh, triangle of distinction. Okay, if we look at uh, the safety needs uh, of the industrial system, um, okay, uh, we need to uh, uh, look at okay the 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 uh, uh, reason why uh, um, it is uh, important to address the safety needs, um, and we need to um, understand okay how how do we apply it to network planning, uh, deployment, and operation. Uh, so the first thing is uh, you know. Uh, looking at that reason of existence of industrial wireless networks uh, you know we need to understand that safety is a system design characteristic um, you know you, you would have heard uh, the term security by design uh, you know in the IT world you may have heard it you know security by design uh, for uh, for the utility industry and you know other energy sectors um, you know uh, that that present really harsh environments to our workforce um, and and very dangerous environment um, to our workforce uh, you know uh, uh, safety by design uh, you know should be uh, sort of a philosophy that we adopt right from the start uh, it must be a system design characteristic um, a, a industrial grade uh, means that enabling uh, mission critical safety implications um, a, a, a is important uh, okay, and which means that uh, we need to understand the requirements, the functional requirements of these applications. Usually, uh, uh, these applications are highly sensitive to delays. Uh, so, an air quality monitoring system in a in an underground mine, for example, or in a confined space, um, uh, uh, you know, is is sensitive uh, to delays um, introduced by the communication system. We need to um, ensure that if there's a problem with air quality that an alarm is triggered in real time uh, as soon as possible uh, so people can react as soon as possible if there's a fire hazard if there's smoke um, uh, uh, that uh, the communication across uh, that entire sometimes remember uh, you know the a, a station can span kilometers uh, so if there's need to be to evacuate let's say a nuclear power plant um, uh, you know that 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 communication uh, uh, gets to uh, uh, the end users as quickly as possible uh, so people can evacuate as quickly as possible uh, uh, so latency becomes critical from that perspective um, you know again environment we've already talked about it these are hazardous environments uh, you know, um, uh, if so, so you know, just one thing I forgot to mention: the presentation is based on a series of white papers that Redline did. Um, uh, you know, and you can you can uh, you know um, read some some detailed case studies in that white paper, and there are references to other industrial research. Uh, one of which, uh, for example, is by a professor um, uh, done more than hundred years ago. Uh, you know that how the wheat dust in a floor mill um, you know how it can become an explosion hazard um, and any uh, device that you deploy any any equipment that you deploy in that uh, environment must um, you know uh, uh, be um, uh, inherently safe okay so in, so so that in 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 intrinsic safety um, uh, that certified device, you know, C1D2 certified device, for example, it is important uh, when we deploy these networks in this kind of an environment from a safety uh, perspective. We, uh, the last thing we would want is for a, 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 you know, a wireless radio to become an explosion hazard uh, in, in such kind of an environment. Uh, so uh, you know reliability um, again uh, 
you know, uh, 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 it's it's another very important criteria. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll go into um, sort of uh, a bit more detail on this one, uh, use it as an example to um, communicate how important it is to dig deeper into these things. And it's not just enough to um, uh, look at a data sheet and look at the MTBF uh, number, the mean time between failure uh, of a, a radio that we buy or any sort of equipment, an Ethernet switch or whatever we buy. It's not just enough to look at the MTBF number and say, yeah, it's 40 years, it's good enough for us. Uh, uh, no, it's not. Um, you know, why it's not, I'll explain that in a bit. Uh, but again, industrial triangle of distinction, um, you know, helps us understand uh, uh, the reason why reliability is important. Um, okay, uh, from a function perspective, um, uh, durability of the industrial grade wireless devices must be aligned with dura durability of the OT systems, not IT system. What that means is, you know, OT systems, we typically expect um, uh, these systems to exist for 15, 20 years minimum. Um, so it's best that the wireless technology we choose uh, will, uh, at least the devices um, uh, uh, will support uh, uh, the OT systems for that amount of period that you don't have to replace uh, and retrofit uh, the wireless equipment, um, you know, just like you would any IT system. In the IT world, I change my laptop every three to five years. Um, you know, that's that's not what you can do when you're deploying, um, you know, a communication infrastructure in a substation. Um, uh, it it'll just be a constant project, a never-ending project, uh, because by the time you're finished with um, you know replacing that network at, at the last transformer station you have to begin to go back to the first transformer station and keep uh, doing it all over again um, so uh, you know that durability alignment is key similarly um, the industrial grade wireless networks um, withstand the environmental impact on reliability and that's uh, key uh, to understand how the environment impacts reliability um, you know, and that's what where we are going to dig deeper. So the first thing I'm going to do is, you know, just give you a quick recap on uh, sort of the bathtub curve of uh, failure. Um, uh, you know, uh, that, that's the typical failure curve uh, that you'd uh, get for any type of equipment out there, specifically hardware equipment. Um, you know, and it, it, reliability, uh, as you can see, and don't be scared with the equation, simple equation, um, it, it's just, uh, you know, exponential uh, to the power minus lambda t, where lambda is the uh, failure rate, uh, t is the time or age of the equipment, and um, m in this case is the mean time between failure. So, uh, you know, as you can imagine uh, uh, from this, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the curve, uh, what it shows is that in the beginning, your failure rate uh, will be high. Typically, it's called the infant mortality rate at system birth. Uh, that's typically high. It's common, uh, you know, within, within the first three to six months, any, um, you know, type of electronics that you would have, uh, the chances of seeing a failure in, in that initial period are much higher than later on. Uh, the system will then stabilize um, and, and failure rate remains flat. Um, you know, everything being ideal, uh, it will sort of match that of the MTBF. Um, and then towards the end of life, uh, you know, um, uh, failure rate, of course, increases. Uh, you know, I think this is pretty common sense, not that difficult to understand. Uh, the problem comes um, is we forget that that MTBF calculation that the manufacturer does is based on assumption of ideal conditions. The equipment is designed for with specific conditions in mind. And if you deviate from those conditions, uh, you know, let's say temperature, uh, you know, a, a very simple criteria is designed for a specific temperature range. If you deviate from temperature range, that failure rate is going to shoot. Uh, the MTBF is no longer going to be valid. Um, you know, that's what uh, you see here in, in this figure. Um, that suddenly it shrinks. Um, you know, the curve shrinks, the bathtub curve, um, and your failure rate uh, goes through the roof, uh, can go through the roof. If you deploy, a, a, you know, uh, an equipment not designed for harsh environment in an environment that is harsh. 
um, you know, that initial assumption that the manufacturer has used for ideal conditions um, is invalidated. Um, okay, and, and because of that, you know, if, if you go back to the vendor and say, well, it, it, gear is, uh, is starting to fail, uh, you know, why is that? They're going to come back and say, well, you know what, uh, you've deployed it in highly corrosive environment, you've deployed it outside of um, the temperature range, um, you know, hence we are not responsible for it. Our MTBF, we stand by uh, MTBF based on certain assumptions. So this is important to understand, you know, that's, uh, you know, reliability is not just looking at MTBF on a data sheet. Um, it's not just ticking a mark on an evaluation matrix when we're uh, selecting these um, uh, technologies and devices for this kind of an infrastructure. Uh, it goes beyond that. Um, and, and that's something we need to understand. Another important thing we need to understand is, you know, what this equation dictates, um, you know, and the first time I saw this, you know, back when, you know, a long time ago is, uh, you know, I, I was surprised, uh, you know, although it's common sense, but if you plug in the numbers, you know, what that equation dictates that at its average life, so if the average life of, um, you know, uh, uh, and, Ethernet switch, for example, uh, is seven years. At that average life, the reliability of that equipment is 36.7%. It's not what it was in the beginning. At that average life, that reliability is going to reduce significantly. So as the equipment ages, uh, you know, that reliability changes. So it's, it's a dynamic number. It's a probability that changes with time. That is something we also need to understand. It changes with time and it changes with space, AKA the place that you deploy it in. That environment has an impact on it. Uh, similarly, uh, security, okay. There's difference in priorities between IT, OT, um, you know, IT, confidentiality of that. Remember, it's managing information. Confidentiality of that information, takes highest priority. In OT, it's availability uh, that takes highest priority. Um, yeah, so, so the priority, uh, um, you know, uh, from a security perspective uh, of, of IT and OT are different. Uh, and when we design this infrastructure, again, it's not just safety by design, it's also security by design. Uh, when we plan and design this infrastructure, we need to keep in mind uh, uh, when we are building infrastructure to address the needs of both IT and OT. The priorities are different and we need to um, uh, design the system for that. Um, you know, goes beyond that, of course, uh, physical tampering protection, uh, you know, sort of the common vulnerability um, and exposure, uh, you know, uh, database alignment, uh, making sure the vendor, uh, you know, keeps track of it uh, and addresses the CDEs, um, uh, you know, um, as soon as possible. Um, all of that is important. You know, I'm, I'm sure in this industry, all of us remember when Stuxnet happened and uh, how big a, of a deal that was. So cybersecurity um, uh, is, is important to address the needs of that, uh, you know, uh, integrating ICT with the power system. Uh, it is greatly beneficial, um, you know, uh, but it does come with that cybersecurity risk and that risk needs to be managed. And the equipment we choose uh, to support the communication needs uh, of our system, uh, you know, that equipment has to make sure that it does not introduce any new security, any additional cybersecurity risks. Um, and it will introduce, sorry, uh, you know, if anyone says it doesn't, you know, they're lying, it will introduce risks, but we need to make sure that equipment is capable of managing those risks and protecting the infrastructure against those risks. Uh, cost effectiveness. Um, again, uh, you know, we need to understand, I'll dig a bit deeper here, uh, you know, uh, one more example um, uh, to show why it's important to dig deeper beyond just saying cost effectiveness. Um, it, it, it is, uh, you know, important to address that. Um, uh, cost effectiveness, it doesn't just mean low cost. Um, you know, in, especially in Canada, the way we are structured, uh, you know, CAPEX is preferred over OPEX. Uh, so it is important 
to sort of address, um, you know, uh, look at cost effectiveness in, in more detail. We look at the durability, scalability, uh, you know, how um, uh, rapid the deployment can be, the power frugality, the support infrastructure that the communication system needs, uh, you know, that has to be cost effective. Um, and most of all, maintainability, as I mentioned, we, uh, you know, in, in this, in the electricity sector in Canada, um, you know, OPEX, um, I'd say, um, at least in my experience, is a big no-no. Uh, you need to reduce it as, as much as possible. So maintainability becomes a key criteria. Because if there's anything we've learned from the telco sector and from the enterprise sector when it comes to uh, ICT technology, um, it's, it's, it's that iceberg effect of life cycle cost. Uh, now, those industries, remember, the way they are structured, uh, you know, they want to minimize their capex and because, it, you know, it's the infrastructure is, is driven by revenue, uh, you know, uh, and they have constant revenue coming in, um, you know, they don't mind an OPEX based model an operational expenditure based model. Uh, so even if even when they go against this iceberg effect of life cycle cost, uh, where most of the cost in reality is, is experienced, um, you know, after the network is deployed, you know, those industries are fine with it. Electricity infrastructure industry, oil and gas mining, they're not. Uh, so we need to make sure that the equipment we select uh, can be maintained. And there's different criteria that is used. And if anyone is interested in that, you can always, I'll provide my contact. You can always reach out to me. Um, and we'll discuss it in more detail as to what that means and how you can ensure the maintainability of the infrastructure that you're building. Uh, quick case study, um, you know, I won't go into too much detail because we don't have that much time, only nine more minutes left. Uh, I want to leave at least five minutes in the end. Um, you know, this was third party consultant and a customer, um, you know, sort of uh, um, uh, use the consultant, uh, an industrial client basically, uh, to test uh, devices, radio devices that were uh, very similar to each other on paper in, in a hostile RF environment. Uh, you know, the, the antenna, the cables, everything was the same. Everything was kept the same. Um, uh, sort of the, the overall design metrics, everything was the same. Uh, the only thing was, that was changed was the radio equipment in itself, the wireless radio in itself. Uh, and as you can see, um, you know, even though on paper they were similar, the, the throughput numbers for all three devices were different. Um, uh, you know, so just because everything is the same on paper, no, it does not mean that the radio is is going to perform in a real world industrial environment uh, uh, the way it is expected to perform on paper. Because on paper, it's all based on ideal conditions assumptions. Um, you know, similarly, in beyond throughput, if you look at latency, significant differences. If you look at uh, packet loss. Uh, significant differences in in uh, for for one of the vendor the packet loss was as high as 50 percent consistent uh, as compared to the other vendor um, you know it was close to zero um, and of course I'm not going to mention who that vendor is this is not a marketing presentation but just you know uh, uh, wanted to share that case study with everyone overall just to summarize this is how um, you know uh, uh, we uh, at redline define what is meant by industrial uh, grade. Um, it's, it's, it's wireless networks that are supposed to be safe and safety enhancing, uh, that are reliable, secure, and cost effective. Uh, and you know, these are not just words. Uh, we go deeper into it. Uh, we look at things like intrinsic safety, safety as a culture, um, you know, uh, the environmental impact, on these devices and and how it changes the MTBF um, and all these factors, uh, you know, and and I know I can talk about this all day long, uh, you know. Um, so if you have any questions, um, I think time to uh, you know get to that. Um, and I know I didn't leave you enough time, so apologize for that. Uh, but if we run out of time, do not hesitate uh, to contact me. Uh, over to you, Far. Perfect. Thank you very much, Dr. Mian. That was a, a fascinating presentation. A lot of content to cover, but uh, you did a great job with that. And uh, certainly, yes, if there are questions and we can't get to them, we will definitely um, make sure you they are answered. Um, to start off, since we do have a little bit of time left, I can uh, quick kick things off with a couple of questions. And uh, uh, just a reminder to the audience, if you do have questions, please enter them now into the chat function. 
the questions function on your screen. So uh, to kick things off, um, you mentioned the importance uh, of safety as a culture characteristic. What do you mean by that? And can you elaborate? Um, yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, safety um, as a culture, um, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of very easy to forget, uh, you know, seldom <laughs> remembered. And I've seen so many. Um, so as you mentioned in the beginning, uh, you know, uh, my key, uh, one of the key areas of my research is, uh, you know, risk management in, in projects when it comes to smart grid projects. Um, uh, and I've seen a lot of project managers uh, struggle with that one uh, when, you know, uh, they are at the end of the day accountable for, uh, you know, any, any uh, you know, sort of safety incidents on the project, specifically when it comes to vendors and things like these. Um, uh, you know, so it, it, it's, it's when we, uh, you know, those of us, uh, and I've spent, I know in, in Hydro One, you know, 10 of the 15 years, even more was in, in the office environment, um, uh, although visits to substations were common, but those of us who are in the office environment, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, may may forget uh, how important it is for uh, the partners that we select uh, for them to understand how important safety is to this uh, this industry. Um, you know, that's that's what I mean by safety as a culture. Um, that uh, you know you you need to make sure that in that project plan uh, you know uh, you have uh, sort of uh, uh, an education process it's not enough to just make a vendor go through a couple of tra hours training on on uh, you know safety in a substation or things like that no they'll learn it they'll forget it uh, I've seen it so many times. So it has to be a constant thing. It has to be a constant reminder to all the stakeholders uh, who are new to this industry because they're introducing a new technology to the industry. Uh, so, you know, it has to be remembered that, you know, in addition to safety as design, you know, safety as a culture from a people perspective is important to follow. And it's important to uh, institutionalize within that project team. Because remember, like, you know, my research is based on the, um, uh, Obama funded, uh, you know, smart grid investment grant program. Um, the average project uh, in that program um, was about five years. So these are long term projects that we are talking about uh, when we, uh, especially when it's on a large scale, it covers transmit, transmission and distribution infrastructure. These are long term projects. Uh, so, so institutionalizing that culture in the project team is very important. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mia. Uh, also, what can you explain what kind of products does the bathtub curb of failure apply to? You were talking about the bathtub curb earlier. Uh, what, um, you know, for example, does it apply to software products? Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, uh, this, the, the bathtub, so it, it's, it's not even the bathtub curve, but the, the, the curve failure curve for the software product is slightly different. Um, you know, is uh, remember software uh, goes through uh, releases, uh, you know, patches, things like that uh, constantly. So a typical vendor would uh, introduce a new release, um, you know, once or twice every year. And every time there's a new release, you sort of go back to that system birth uh, on that curve, uh, um, uh, you know, so you'll have the failure rate is going to be a bit higher. Um, and and then slowly it will drop and you'll go back to your regular uh, average, um, you know, but then there's a new release uh, six or 12 months from that point and then you're back there again. So it's kind of a, uh, you know, a zigzag kind of a curve, um, you know, in case of software, uh, but for hardware electronics, um, you know, the curve is very, very close to uh, what I showed on the slides. Um, the way you deal with uh, with that kind of a curve, failure curve in the software uh, case, um, is uh, maybe making sure you have, uh, you know, and we used to do this in, in Hydro One as well, is, um, you know, uh, when you bring in new technology into the infrastructure, uh, you basically, um, you know, uh, go for a three to five year maintenance contract, software maintenance contract, so all released are done, you invest in a sandbox, uh, uh, environment to make sure you test every release and things like this. Excellent. That was great. Um, so we are now just out of time. So uh, we will conclude the presentation there. Thank you for answering those questions and for the wonderful presentation 
Um, before we end our session today, I'd like to remind our audience uh, of our upcoming webinars on June 16th, which is actually a Wednesday, not a Thursday. Uh, Utilisys will be joining us to present on how AI-powered analytics is helping utilities unlock the value of AMI. On June 24th, MNP will be joining us to present on cyber risk assessments after an incident. Um, all of CA's future events and webinars can be found on our monthly newsletter on uh, current affairs, or you can also find them on our website uh, under the news and events section at electricity.ca. Uh, in closing, again, Dr. Mia, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us, also for Redline Communications, uh, for being a corporate partner with us. And uh, with that, we will uh, conclude today's session. We will talk to everybody next time and hope you guys stay safe. Bye for now. Thank you.